Hello and welcome to today's webinar about how social landlords can better drive a proactive complaints handling process. Today's event, sponsored by Locales, is about probably the fundamental issue affecting landlord-tenant relationships today. Indeed, when he introduced the Social Housing Regulation Bill back in June, the then Housing Secretary, Michael Gove, gosh, doesn't that seem a long time ago, uh, mentioned poor complaint handling in the very first line, stressing it was that the, the, the bill was designed to tackle situations in which tenants wait months for repairs and are routinely ignored by their landlord. Just prior to that, in March this year, the Housing Ombudsman updated and strengthened its complaint handling process. This increased the duty on social landlords to raise awareness of the complaints process and make it made it explicitly clear uh, that a self-assessment on complaints performance should be completed by them um, every year. And, uh, and alongside that, um, the Ombudsman published its annual review of the sector's performance when it came to complaints handling. And that saw it reveal that it upheld 66% of complaints about complaint handling made by residents in the last year. Common problems that, that, that it found, um, so, 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 so this is where it, it, it found the sector to be, be struggling, if you like, were included poor record keeping, poor communication, and a lack of follow-up. Um, the housing ombudsman uh, himself, Richard Blakeway, said at the time that its analysis strongly suggests both complaint handling and service delivery need to be improved across our membership. And he added that as a result, um, he strongly encouraged senior leaders to facilitate a wider discussion about their organization's success in this area. Um, so the aim really for today's webinar is to feed into that process and, and certainly to widen that conversation out um, and hopefully share some learning along the way. So we'll be looking to find out the extent to which the complaint handling code is already driving change. We'll be looking at what changes organisations should and are putting in place to meet the terms of the code and the extent to which technology is supporting that offer. And of course, a, a debate about complaints is a debate about service delivery and standards too. So we'll be talking about how the standard of homes and services are changing at the same time. We've got a fantastic panel lined up for us today to talk us through this important topic. We'll be hearing from Jarhead Rahman, uh, Head of Housing Transformation at Hackney Council, Sean Grant and Lorraine Butler. Uh, Sean's the Executive Director of Operations and Lorraine's uh, the Customer Services Manager with Salix Homes and Gary Rosier-Taylor, VP of Sales with Locales. So welcome all. Um, I'm not sure at the minute, I think there's been some problems with my um, uh, video today. Um, so apologies if I'm not on the screen, um, but, but that, that, that may well be a, a, a saving grace for the, the, the audience today. Um, but welcome all, and we've got a lot to get through today. Just a reminder to everybody tuning in um, that this is your opportunity to ask questions that will be useful to you, will help guide your own organisation's thinking and your own um, uh, performance and, and ideas that you're feeding in. Um, so do use the question and answer box to ask the questions that are most relevant to you, um, and we'll, we'll get to them um, or as, through as many of them as possible in the conversation that follows um, the presentations. So just a bit of teeing up there and just to remind you that that box is there and this is definitely an opportunity for you to ask the questions um, that, uh, that, that that you have. Um, right, uh, before we get started, let's, let's find out a little bit about the audience today as well. Um, and we'll move to the slides. Um, so I think we've got a poll question uh, that, that hopefully will be popping up on the screen um, uh, very shortly. So, yeah, I'll, I'll move to the poll question now. And that question is, how satisfied are you that your organisation has sufficiently educated your tenants on how to report repair and services complaints to the Ombudsman? Um, so just a, just a bit bit of a, a feel for the room today, just to see where, where you think your organisations are, and so we can kind of tailor some of those questions. So a range of answers there. We've already appointed a leader to champion this and doing everything in our power to support our residents. We are intending to introduce a dedicated resource to address these issues this year. This is something we've just begun to think about. Um, we haven't and don't plan to do anything differently, or I don't know. Um, so, yeah, let's let's just see where, where everybody in the room is today. We'll give you another uh, couple of seconds to to, to uh, click on. And, right, let's move to the, to the answers, if we can. So let's just get a bit of a feel for where everybody in the room is today. And that, again, will help guide the discussion as, 
So if we can just move to the poll results now, um, that, that would be absolutely great. Bit of a split, um, but but um, over 50% of you in the room today have already appointed the leader of the champion list and doing everything in your power to support residents. Um, um, and then 20%, so uh, yeah, one in five, intending to introduce dedicated dedicated resource to address these issues this year so things things moving on um and and certainly um uh, plenty of learning to kind of share and pick up on i think um uh, as, as we move there right that is more than enough from me and we'll move on to our first presentation today so go ahead welcome and it's over to you uh thank you martin for the introduction um so my name is jada Rahman. i'm the divisional head of housing transformation and home ownership service at the London Borough of Hackney. Um, I thought it would be useful really to talk about um, our improvement and journey since the introduction of the Housing Ombudsman Code in September 2020. Um, as you're all aware, the Housing Ombudsman Code was initially launched in 2020. Uh, but prior to that, uh, from the Social Housing White Paper, we knew there was a lot of emphasis on landlords and how they deal with um, housing complaints. So in Hackney, we started to review internally how we can manage complaints more effectively. Um, and as many organisations may have, uh, similar to Hackney, we had a housing department, but different teams dealing with complaints. What we really wanted to try and achieve was consistency in the way we handle and deal with all of our complaints. So one of the first things that we did was did an internal review to understand where we've got good practices around how we deal with complaints some areas where we can really improve it. The second thing we did really to make sure there's a consistency in complaint handling was establish a permanent central housing complaints team. Um, and that team really dealt with all incoming complaints coming into housing. Uh, we then launched a new complaints procedure um, in line with some of the outcomes the housing ombudsman would want to see in terms of how you handle a complaint, how you keep the customer informed. Uh, in addition to that, at the same time, we introduced in November 2020 a new complaints handling system, and that was introduced across the council because we recognise um, the system uh, and having a good system can really enhance that customer experience. And then in January 2021, uh, we introduced the complaint handling transactional satisfaction survey. So once you've reported a complaint, we close that, close down that complaint how would you rate the satisfaction of the handling? And then one of the things that's really ongoing uh, and is consistent is making sure when we receive all of the complaints, we do a lessons learned, um, and that lessons learned is shared with the organisation and the senior management team. And in addition, there's the need to do the annual self-assessment, uh, which is required going forward. Um, I thought I'll talk a bit about our process, just so I can share with other organisations the process that we've adopted. So when a complaint first comes in to Hackney, one of the first things we try and do is we try and telephone the resident just to acknowledge the complaint, ask them, is there anything more they would like to add to the complaint and introduce you know, our team so customers have a first point of contact. Often when you find complaints and they do come in, sometimes it doesn't necessarily need the organisation 10 working days to resolve. Um, so most organisations like Hackney may receive, receive complaints related to repairs. Um, and sometimes those are quick fixes. So one of the things that we've established within housing are complaint leads. So when a complaint comes in in relation to a repair, we would automatically pass that over to our repairs team who's a lead. And often if it's a plumber that needs to attend or a carpenter, we'd send the operative uh, and that would be prioritised. Um, and it, generally in those types of scenarios, once the operatives attended, they've carried out the repair, the customer is quite happy with the outcome. So it doesn't need to necessarily go through our formal 10 days um, complaints procedure. If the customer is not happy with the outcome, we do a full investigation into the nature of the complaint. And then uh, we uh, keep the customer informed and work with the various departments in housing to progress the complaint, investigate the issues, and try and give a resolution to our resident. If, and after the first stage, um, the resident's still not happy with our first stage complaint process, 
they can then escalate that to our stage two process, and they've got 15 uh, working days to do that. Stage two in the council is re reviewed by a different team, by the chief executive director, who's fairly independent, and they review the outcome of the stage one uh, complaint. If after stage two, uh, the resident is still not satisfied, then we advise the resident to contact the housing ombudsman or a designated person. So that, in a nutshell, is the internal process that we follow when dealing with complaints coming into the business. I think this bit is really important. So one of the things that we introduce within our procedure is line management escalation when dealing with complaints. Often you'd find in large organisations, certainly more on the operational side, they're very busy dealing with the operational day-to-day -day business. So when a complaint does come in, in some cases, not always prioritised. One of the key um, uh, key focus for me and my team was to make sure when a complaint does come in, there's a corporate buy-in in how uh, these uh, complaints should be treated and how it should be prioritised. So one of the things that we've introduced within our complaints procedure is uh, when a complaint comes in, we'd allocate that complaint to the relevant department within one working day. And then that department then has really two working days to acknowledge the complaint. If they don't acknowledge that complaint, it then gets escalated to their manager. If their manager don't escalate or acknowledge uh, that complaint, it can then be escalated to their manager all the way up to the director of housing service. And we felt this was really needed to establish a culture change around how complaints are prioritised uh, across the organisation. I think it's important to just quickly highlight some of the lessons that we've learned over the last 12 months. The majority of the new comp complaints that we received in housing relates to leaks, damps and mould. Um, so we've established a really proactive initiative by a building maintenance department and, and implemented an improvement action plan to reduce the number of these uh, types of complaints coming into the business. So as most landlords would have experienced during COVID, uh, most repairs would have been fairly limited. Some would have been only providing an emergency only service. That inevitably built a backlog of repairs that needed to be done when uh, uh, lockdown was restricted. Um, so we've been prioritising to clear the backlog. Um, one of the things that we've really focused on in order to do that is increase the operation capacity of our repairs team to help with dealing with the backlog. We're moving to a new way of working where we're reporting and treating all leaks as urgent for that to be responded within 24 hours. We're developing a damp and mold strategy and establishing a property MOT program where we target problems um, in blocks where we're receiving a lot of complaints from. Um, I think Whilst you can improve the handling, you can improve the internal culture, um, what I do really want to focus on is internally having robust performance monitoring on how complaints are dealt with. Um, and this is really important to understand as an organisation, how many complaints are you receiving? How many are you closing down? Where you do have overdue cases that go beyond the housing ombudsman target of 10 days, um, how are they prioritised? How are you tracking those overdue cases? How has that been escalated? And I think it's important to analyse trends in complaints coming into, into the business by the financial year. So certainly some of our, our complaint volumes are a lot higher than what we had three years ago, and that's a trend across the sector. Um, really understanding when you do have complaints coming into the business, what are the key themes uh, residents are complaining about? What are the individual areas the complaints relate to? sharing all of those with individual service areas and delivering local improvement action plan. More importantly, it's really understanding, you know, what can we as an organisation learn from the lessons um, and change in the way we do our business. Really share your case findings um, and work really proactively with the housing ombudsman when you do have cases that are investigated by the housing ombudsman. Um, but more importantly, as a management team, make sure the senior management scrutiny. So one of the things that we do in Hackney is we report we've got a number of KPIs in housing uh, related to complaints. And as a management team, we look at how different departments are performing against those KPIs. 
Um, a, a, a final point, uh, the regulator of um, social housing announced uh, the confirmed perception surveys. There are three that are really related to complaint handling going forward. So there's the one which is around the satisfaction with the landlord's approach of handling complaints, and that will be measured by the tenant perception survey. Um, the other one is around complaint relative to the size of the landlord. And again, this is really important indicator where you're a really, really large organisation with a large number of properties, your complaint volume may be higher in comparison to a small organisation with small number of properties. And then complaints responded to within the complaint handling time scale of 10 days. Again, that's a perception survey that all landlords would need to submit against how they're performing against those three criteria. Martin, over back to you. Thanks so much. And, and yeah, I mean, a, a huge amount to, to pick up on in the, the, the question and answer that, that follows. And, and we've got a, 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 a number of questions coming in already. Um, so th th thanks very much. And just a reminder to to everybody um, who, who is tuning in. Um, absolutely, this is an opportunity for you to, to, to get questions that are going to be practically useful to you um, and the, the types of issues you're wrestling with in your own organisation. So do get them coming in and I will get through to as many as possible. Um, following the presentations and like I say a number already coming in um, via, the, via that question and answer box so um, thanks very much for that. Um, great Gary uh, the, uh, well, welcome uh, and the floor is yours it's over to you. Thanks Martin uh, before we get going uh, just check the audio all okay? All fine yeah can, can hear you loud and clear yeah. Perfect wonderful um, so first off uh, thanks, Martin, for uh, and, and the rest of the team at Inside Housing for, for, for facilitating uh, this particular webinar. It's certainly a, a hot topic and certainly something that's that's definitely on our radar here at Locals. Um, so I'd like to kick off the, uh, the, 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 the kind of presentation. I, I use this phrase so, so often. More often than not, it's not about the problem or the complaint. It's about how organisations deal with it <clears throat> that triggers a tenant's viewpoint on the organisation. So um, what I want to do is kind of take you through a little bit of uh, what goes through my mind on a day to day basis. So um, first off, I will define a complaint. Um, it's a statement, whether it's written, electronic or verbal, that is something unsatisfactory or unacceptable to a tenant's perspective. Now, obviously, we have a complaints process, but that shouldn't deem us to ignore other sentiments or other conversations um, that are had with uh, any member of the organization that we're talking about, whether it's um, a social housing, local council, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, I think it's really, really important for us to remember that a complaint isn't just about the complaint that comes through uh, through the, the the functional process, but also any gripe or any murmur of, of um, a unsatisfactory uh, service or <coughs> um, uh, you know, and any unhappiness around from a tenant's perspective. Um, then, uh, so kind of just moving on a little bit quicker from that as well. So um, let's be really, really clear. You know, 40, well, and certainly uh, over 40% of all complaints are relating to, you know, repairs and maintenance or service um, across the year. That's actually an increase of about 65% year on year from, from 2021. So a huge growth within this particular area and within this particular sector and something we need to take stock of and take note of very, very quickly within, uh, within our organizations. Um, when thinking about complaints or complaints processes, um, one thing I think is really, really um, important for every single person to, to take into consideration is uh, contextual information is critical for any trigger or any uh, conversation with a tenant. So um, it's all well and good, you know, doing surveys and, and don't get me wrong, we are, we, 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 we functionally support, um, you know, uh, one star, five star reviews, CSAT, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of the time, the contextual information gets skipped off the back of this. Um, somebody could be unhappy with the work that was done, but pleased it has been actually done. You know, they might be unhappy with the, the, the quality of the plastering or the color of the paint, but actually that doesn't mean they're dissatisfied with the service, um, you know, and, and that the actual repair has been achieved. Um, sometimes it's about setting expectations at the start of it as opposed to waiting down, you know, further down the line. So 
I think it's really, really important and really valuable that we all take a, a, a bit of a step back at times and look at contextual information that is absolutely critical to a complaint. Now, I'm going to shift a little bit further back now and relate to something I said a little bit earlier, um, which is, uh, you know, um, so basically, um, looking at the problem, it's not. It's about how you deal with it that's more valuable to um, us as a tenant or a, a, as a customer. Um, so my biggest advice for any organization out there is get yourself ahead of the game. Now, if we think about the 40% of um, complaints that are relating to service and repairs, which is a growth of 65%, 90% of those um, uh, complaints occur after a tenant has had an interaction that they've already told us that they're unhappy. And what we do is we don't, we don't resolve the problem there and then, um, or we don't acknowledge the problem. Um, so I'm really going to sort of touch on some things that we can do to get ahead of the game as opposed to uh, being behind the game line. OK, so I think you know, most importantly, acknowledgement is 50 percent of the battle. Um, apologies for my very cheesy slide of Tiger Woods, but I'm a massive golf fan, so he had to crop up somewhere in this particular presentation. So there he is. Um, acknowledging um, a, a, an issue or a complaint sometimes takes a tenant back and goes, OK, they understand my challenge. Um, what we also need to do is understand the impact of those challenges, um, you know, being very, very open and honest, um, you know, uh, whether it's damp or mold in a, in a property, um, it's going to have two different impacts on two different people, whether somebody, um, you know, has, uh, is asthmatic versus somebody who's not asthmatic. The impact of that challenge uh, or that, uh, that issue is fundamentally different. It's the same problem, but it's different in terms of the impact that it has on somebody's day to day life or, 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 the, or where they're living. So um, just acknowledging that is sometimes, you know, 50 percent of the battle. In fact, a lot of the time it's 50 percent of that, 50 percent of the battle. And then we talk about it. So um, we've got ahead of the game. We've acknowledged our, the, the, the challenge and the problem. Communicate. Um, and again, um, Jarhead has uh, is, is obviously explained you know, some of the processes that London Borough of Hackney go through. Um, what we're seeing within um, certainly our customer base and, and how they're communicating uh, with, with customers is you've really never heard anybody complain about being communicated to after an issue they've, they've raised. If anything, they complain more because they haven't heard anything about it. Um, now, I know that's easier said than done, but it's having a regimented structure within your process before you have a complaint um, or an official complaint through the official complaints process. That is how you get ahead of the game and reduce that, that time and that ethos behind it. So um, just really want to sort of portray that is you really never ha you know, have uh, anybody complaining about um, you know, being over communicated to. And that leads me on to something else. And um, this is something I, you know, I've certainly seen a lot of organizations moving towards very, very quickly. Um, Jared, I think you had uh, something around 15 days uh, within there to, to get a tenant to uh, come back to you or, or at least um, you know, respond to. Give yourselves an SLA. How do you stack up to your SLA? And make sure that the SLA that you're setting yourself exceeds or beats what you're given by uh, the housing ombudsman. OK, um, you know, fundamentally, the further ahead you can be, you can raise issues, raise, you know, um, you know, raise awareness, pick up something that may may not have been dealt with in time before it reaches escalation process. Um, I know that sounds relatively logical. I know that sounds really simple. Uh, but again, a lot of organizations that I've seen and, and certainly I've worked with in the last um, uh, kind of seven or eight years certainly haven't set themselves um, SLAs around dealing with complaints. Um, so. But that's just something I, th I think all organizations should have. And then last of all, um, and, and again, you know, most important and most, and most critical thing is involving a tenant in how you've handled or is it the issue or the complaint. Um, you know, understanding if they, you've dealt with it satisfactorily um, you know, or, or to meet their expectations, because if it's still not met their expectations, the only thing that's going to happen is that's going to extrapolate into a, a larger or a bigger challenge or problem for your business. 
Um, again, if we followed the process through, you know, getting ahead of the game, over communicated um, throughout the process, um, understand, understand and acknowledge the issue and the challenge that is ahead alongside, you know, understand if you've dealt with it satisfactorily, that will ultimately tick the box from a tenant's perspective. Um, ultimately, the, the biggest goal here is actually solving and resolving the issue. But ultimately, um, you know, as I say, you know, asking or getting consideration from your tenants on how you've actually handled the issue is so incredibly valuable for you and the rest of your business and the rest of your team. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to shuffle on um, and say thanks very much for listening to me for a relatively short space of time, uh, but look forward to some of the questions, um, you know, a little bit later on as well. Um, so, Martin, back to you. Thanks very much. And yeah, I, I, I mean, again, lots of um, issues. I think I mean, we've got loads of questions coming in, actually. So um, lots of issues kind of pick up on um, very, very shortly and, and, and delve into a bit more. Re really, really useful. Um, th th thanks very much for, for that. And then just a reminder, do keep using that question and answer box um, if you're tuning in um, and we'll pick up on them very, very shortly um, and hope to get you some specific answers to some of the, the questions you're mm. wrestling with. Um, so th thanks very much for that. And, and now, um, welcome. Uh, we've got Sean and Lorraine. Um, so, so welcome both. And I think, Sean, you're up first. So, so over to you. Hi, everyone. I'm Sean Grant. I'm the Exec Director of Operations. And I'm here with Lorraine Butler, who's our uh, Customer Service Manager. And we're going to talk to you a bit about our complaints journey, which centres more around how we actually listen to the customer in our complaints process. So we've had quite a robust complaints process for quite a while. But what we were finding was that we sometimes missed or sometimes customers dissatisfied with our responses because we missed what they were actually saying to us. So we've done quite a lot of work in various stages over the last couple of, of years to address that. So I'm going to go through some of that journey and then Lorraine's going to talk about what we've actually done in terms of more of the detail. So we kind of started a, our journey on complaints listening of the pre-COVID. So it's, we've kind of had a COVID interrupt in some of what we've been doing. And we, were get, we, we identified that we were getting complaints in quite complex complaints where we weren't really hearing what the customer was saying in those complaints and the customer was being coming back quite dissatisfied. So we were basically, well, our staff, our, our teams were responding in time and they were, they were doing full responses. Those responses weren't necessarily hearing what the customer said, so issues were being missed or not addressed in those complaints. We weren't respecting the customer perspective. There was then quite strongly a lack of listening or empathy in some of our responses. And also when we had, because we were in different teams, we, we had a lack of joined up response. So we had almost like a silo working mentality in some of our complaint responses that didn't pick up all the issues or the responding manager would only respond to their bits and miss the other bits. So we identified a bit of a kind of cultural problem. So we put in place, and this is probably 2018, 19 initially, um, a program to start to address that culture issue and those silo issues to kind of get people to work together a bit better and to respond to customers a bit better. And we call that the Difference You Make program. And we've done quite a lot of work with our management team and our service managers to work through what were the issues that they were experiencing, where were the gaps, how could they overcome them, and got them to put in place action plans around how they could listen to customer problems a bit better or where we were failing to deliver services, which obviously links back to the complaints we were getting. So we gave better responses. And in fact, so that things didn't even escalate to complaint in the first place, to be fair, that we addressed things when they first occurred. And we've gone quite a way down that program and that was then and we were getting some good results but that was then interrupted by us all going home one day because of covid and became a lot more difficult program to deliver from home um so it was kind of interrupted or stalled in a way we have also since then and kind of almost concurrently um, developed a customer charter and our customer charter was developed to respond to a number of things the social housing white paper building safety um, charter, the Tenants Together Charter, and our, our own kind of customer charter that we had in place, which was a bit kind of sat on the shelf and wasn't an active document. And we worked with customers, our customer committee, to develop a customer charter that was very, very much around how we respond to customers and how we respect customers and had the seven main principles, one of which in there is resolution and is very much around the customer voice and complaints. 
And so we kind of tried to embed that within the culture of the organisation. And there, there is an expectation that staff are monitored according to the customer charter. And we do um, regular service assessments against the customer charter and import those back to our custom committee so that we pick up kind of the culture behind how we respect customers and how we hear their voice within how we deliver our services, which again feeds into our complaints processes and how we respond to complaints. We also carried out post COVID a restructure. Um, and whilst we had a complaints team or a complaints person prior to COVID, we've we strengthened that team within the new structure. So we had a more people or a couple of people making up that complaints team and they had a greater focus both on ensuring that complaints responses were handled within time and according to the right processes, but also picking up what we were learning from complaints. And Lorraine's going to go into a bit more detail around that in her bit of the presentation. We've also, as others have mentioned, carried out an assessment against the complaints handling code to make sure we're meeting all parts of that. And we've only got one part where we're partially um, not compliant against one of the mandatory elements, which is around telling people about the ombudsman themselves. Um, but that's, we don't tell everybody in all letters, we only tell them in complaints letters. So it's a, a partial non-compliance. And also as part of Build Back Better and as part of our overall governance structure, we've set up a complaints oversight group of customers who also feed into our complaints learning and what we're, what we, how we're responding. They look at sample letters. And again, Lorraine's going to go into that in a little bit more detail. So we'll hand over to Lorraine and she'll give you a bit of the detail of what we've done. Yes, thank you, Sean. Um, as Sean mentioned, although we'd already made some quite a few inroads in improving our complaint handling process, um, operationally, we wanted to tighten things further. Um, so we devised um, a very specific complaints training programme for responding managers, um, both responders at stage one um, and stage two. And whilst they received complaints training prior to this, the emphasis was far more on the customer voice um, rather than the process and the policy because they were quite familiar with that already and we already had it um, fully, the process was fully incorporated into our Dynamics 365 system. So we were very much looking at trying to change people's perspective and have those light bulb moments about what it feels like from a customer perspective when they're dissatisfied with something we have or haven't done. Um, and actually looking at the voice and incorporating kind of the attitude, if you like, um, both within and outside of social housing around um, social housing stigma um, and unconscious bias. And we used the um, snippets from the Grenfell documentary to really bring home how that feels from customer when they don't feel listened to. Um, so that was some really interesting debate that we had with our managers. Um, and really sort of helped them to understand or see complaints differently. Um, within that training, we also um, involved session on lessons learned, and we'd already started sort of identifying lessons learned and capturing them, um, but we also found there were quite a few bits being missed, and it was largely where managers sort of expected it to be a, a significant policy change or something much bigger that needed to be, you know, count as a lesson learned rather than some of the more nuanced, smaller things like improving communication or including a, a small step in a process to update the customer. And all of those things made such a difference in terms of how that customer um, felt about the process and how that complaint and their dissatisfaction was being handled. Um, we also incorporated the lesson learned element of the process within our CRM system as well, so that managers were able to um, be guided through that process and to actually think about where there was any partial or fully upheld element within a complaint response that they really thought about where they could um, improve things for the future to prevent that from happening again. And our complaint support team have, have now started a piece of work where they're looking back at previous six months lessons learned to see where um, whether that has been effective, whether the um, complaints since then have um, either repeated or have reduced as a result of the um, actions that have been put in place. Um, we also, within the training, we also looked at the complaint handling code changes and the updates and discussed them in practice and what that actually meant for responding managers. So it wasn't just um, sort of theory um, over here. We actually kind of brought it to life um, so that responding managers really had a, a good handle on what the code was and what that meant for them in terms of their investigation and responses. Um, in training, we also went through with the customer service centre and, and delivered a bespoke training 
course for them. Um, and that was very much about that initial resolution and really listening to the customer properly identifying what the issues were. As Sean said, sometimes we felt that they were getting lost. So we'd gone down one track when actually what the customer was saying was something different. And so we really kind of took time with the customer service officers to help them understand and listen to what the customer is actually saying. And where possible, use our um, second tier within the customer service center to try and resolve um, those issues um, at first point of contact. And we also used our complaint oversight group, and it's a fairly new group, um, but already they've um, had two meetings where they've looked through sample complaints and done more of a deep dive um, response analysis. So really looking into the bones of the responses to get a feel for whether there's consistency across the tone, whether there's any defensiveness in that. Um, and that's been really, really useful. And we've already incorporated some of the feedback from that group and from those customers into our um, processes. Um, in addition, we had some complaints club sessions. We had everybody fighting over um, being part of the complaints club, but that was really about getting small groups of people together to look at a case review more objectively and see where the learning can be incorporated. And then more in-depth um, reviews by service area um, where there were particular issues, particularly around the repairs team, for example. Um, the team also gives one-on-one -on -one very individual support to managers who've got particularly complex complaints, and that really helps them to understand what the issues are and how to best approach that investigation. But also we've looked at multi-team manager meetings where there are um, complaints or dissatisfaction across departments that touch the number of areas so that we're not all sort of individually going off on our own silo and actually we're having a coordinated response and everybody's clear on what the a what the issues are and where that touches their area and how best to approach that so the customer gets a, a full and complete and coherent response so these are just some of the things that we've done really to tighten that that process further so it'll be interesting to see if we um, see that reflected in our um, complaints handling satisfaction from our customers thank you Fabulous, right? Th 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 thanks, thanks both. I think we um, are. Sorry, I was just, I was just uh, re reading through um, some of the questions that are coming in as um, as the presentation is, is is going on. There's there's lots of questions coming in. There's loads loads of people wanting um, quite specific answers or to explore um, to problems they're wrestling with or to explore some of the issues um, that, that that have been raised during the presentations. Um, so thank you. Some some really great insight. Um, uh, uh, there and some 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 interesting kind of challenge and, and, and thoughts um, uh, uh, emerging there as well. I mean, I was I was thinking about. I think I think it was uh, Gary was uh, uh, talk, talking about how people are, are uh, complain or, or, or are concerned if they haven't heard anything. Um, and you know, I think I think uh, you know that's something that you you hear coming from the, from the ombudsman. I mean, I remember. Uh, my own partner, and she's a, a shared owner, um, uh, would, would call up and, and quite often the response would come back, we need to speak to somebody else about that, we'll call you back. Um, and of course, the callback very rarely happened. It was a, it was a very small percentage of, of, of occasions, I think, where, where that callback happened. And yeah, uh, I think interesting to start to unpick kind of, uh, uh, you know, from that last presentation about the siloed approach, how you start to go about tackling some of those um uh, uh things but let's let's uh, actually there's a question that's just come in which i think uh, it kind of starts 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 to, to get under the skin of, of quite a few of those issues um so it's a question from christina and i might i might well just start with this one because i think it's an interesting one to, to to when you're examining a system um and what, what what may need to change and improve about the system um uh yeah so christina's question is when is the right time to ask a complaint uh, complainant sorry about how their complaint was handled so where in the process are, are you you doing that and, and and also where in the process is 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 it important to be asking those questions to be understanding and perhaps reporting uh reporting back uh Jayad, it's been, it's been a while since we, we heard from you so i'll hand over to you first on that thanks martin I think for Hackney, the, the, the right moment is once we've closed down the complaint, irrespective if the resident then wanted to escalate it to stage two. Um, I know some organisation where um, the complaint has been closed down um, and there's no need to escalate, they'll ask that question. And some question, regardless if the complainant is escalating or not, they're asking that question. So for us, it was asking that question regardless 
um, if it's been escalated or not, because the issue isn't about the outcome of the complaint. The issue is about the handling. So when you reported your complaint to Hackney, did someone call you? Did someone introduce you? If we're likely to go beyond the 10 working days, did one of our officers contact you to let you know, keep you updated? So, so really, the, the right time is once you've closed down the complaint. Thanks, thanks very much. And um, yeah, just just uh, a number of questions along those uh, that 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 theme. Um, and interesting to see whether we've got a consensus around that being the the, the, the right time. Uh, Gary, I'll bring you in in on that. And then there's a, a few questions, uh, specific questions. I'll, I'll um, uh, uh, move on to in a second. But but Gary, same same question to you. I think it's a really interesting question, and to be honest, I guess it, it, it relies on how you how you word or how you phrase that question. Your two things you want to find out is how do we deal with the deal, deal with your, your your complaint or your process in terms of you know did we understand, did we acknowledge, did we do the right things and the right steps? Then there's the have we actually sorted it, um, and have we actually dealt with the uh, the, the overall and, and overarching impact on that on that particular issue? So uh, for me, it just comes down to you know what what uh, terminology you utilize if you're if you're aiming to understand how you dealt with it i would say you can do that immediately you know essentially after the first time you've responded how do we deal with your complaint um if you want to wanting to look at how do we deal with it as an overarching thing of you know is the problem fixed and um you know how do we actually hand, handle it um as, as a as a team and as a business um that will be after it's been closed down um and not escalated in my view um but that, that, that's a, a personal perspective if you don't do it then my fear would be as you would uh, be some negativities or um you've handled it really well you've got something booked in in two three four weeks and, and maybe it's not being dealt with completely at that particular point in time um, there's still gonna be some negativity because there's still going to be the, the, the problem going on in the background so um to actually you know get get to the root cause of it so um very uh, very wishy-washy answer if i'm honest but um again it just depends on the context that you want to get is it down to dealing with the problem and actually getting that fixed or is it down to how you actually handled it um, depends on the timeline that I would do that. Thanks very much, Gary. And we, we've got some questions coming in about how tenants are involved in that process of decision making as well, we'll which we'll come to in a, in a, in a second. Um, but 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 uh, yeah, no, really helpful. There's a couple of specific questions which I might move to before we get onto that though. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Sean and Lorraine, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you back in um, because there's a, a few specific questions about the complaint oversight group. Um, which um, uh, various people seem to be in, interested in exploring um, uh, the, the, for, for obvious reasons. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll throw them both at you, actually, and, and we can answer them in order. Um, so a question from Chloe. Um, uh, do the complaint oversight group review complaints, complaint themes only, or do they investigate and provide responses to formal complaints? Um, so, yeah, quite quite how they come in. And then uh, uh, along similar lines from Joe, um, would Lorraine be able to share the terms of reference for the customer complaint oversight group? Uh, we are implementing a similar group and it would be helpful to see roles and responsibilities for customers participating. Um, so uh, as that one was aimed at you, Lorraine, I'll bring you in first and, uh, and then and then Sean. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Um, yeah, just in answer to the, the first one, um, just to be clear, our complaints oversight group don't um, investigate or respond to customers. So they will look at the responses once the responses have been sent by the investigating managers from the previous quarter. And they will look at, um, A, they will look at themes, but they'll also look at the tone of the response. So really drilling down into the detail of that and how that has felt from a customer perspective. So they're looking at it completely fresh um, to get an understanding of what the issues were. So A, were they clearly set out in the first place within the complaint response? And then were each of those issues adequately investigated, thoroughly responded to um, in a manner which um, was clear to the customer and provided also that sort of um, empathy and, and um, showing that they giving a feeling that they were being taken seriously. Um, so that's really what they're looking at in a very detailed um, way, rather than sort of looking at purely at the, the numbers um, and the high level themes, although they are also looking at those um, trends as well. Um, and of course, yes, we'll share the tools with you, the complaint and oversight group. Fabulous. Thanks very much. And and Sean, I'll bring you you in, you in there as as, as well if, if if that's okay. And then we'll move on to some of the questions we've we've got about 
residents and resident involvement uh, in, in in some of that decision making because I think a re really important one to be wrestling with and certainly some that a number of our audience seem to be doing today and just a reminder there's loads of questions coming in but but do keep them coming in and, and I'll get through as many as possible to make it as useful as possible for you to go back and um, to you, the, the day job once this is finished um so Sean over to you I've got probably got nothing much further to add to what Lorraine said on the compliance oversight group I think she explained it fairly well um so yeah, sorry, Martin. There's probably not much, much more to say. <laughs> no, no, absolutely fine. In which case, I will come back uh, on on the, um, the, the 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 lessons or, uh, uh, and the work with residents. Um, so, um, uh, I, I mean, I guess actually probably a question to 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 to, to everybody. This was specifically uh, addressed to Jaihead earlier, but I'll, I'll uh, Sean, I'll bring you in first, and I'll move to Jaihead. Um, so, f first one is. Do you share lessons learned with residents? So um, the, there's a lot of learning we've been talking about today, a lot of developing services. What is being shared with residents and what what, what chance are they getting to kind of input into to some of that decision making? So Sean first and then I'll, I'll move to Joe Head. So we'd, we'd be sharing our lessons learned, kind of like an overview on our website so that we can almost, a, you said we did. So every so often, a like quarterly, we look at what we've learned and share that information as a more summarised version. Um, we also share it um, to our customer uh, committee, which is part of our government structure, just sits under the board. They're, they are responsible in their terms of reference for complaints monitoring. So we do a, a quarterly report to, to that group and a big section of that report is on lessons learned, what lessons came up in the quarter, what we've done about them and what the actions are going forward. So almost they then track how we're applying those lessons throughout, you know, coming back in six months, have you done anything? Has anything improved? So it's almost like a dynamic process. So we share at one level with the wider customer body and then in it with, you know, within the kind of the customer engagement structure so that people are able to influence what we're learning and almost the actions we're taking, if that makes sense. Very much, and, and Jahed, I'll, I'll bring you in now. Um, kind of that, that same same question. So, do you share lessons learned with residents? But but also, I just want to push at that in, in terms of the agency they've got in, in kind of setting um, the, 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 what, what gets re, uh, re, reported, or indeed the, the, the kind of systems that are in place in the first place. So, to what, what agency um, do, 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 would residents have within your system um, for, for influencing? Um, I guess the questions that you're asking. Sure. Uh, so, so one of the things that we do within the annual report, we, we talk about how we're dealing with complaints. And just last month, we agreed with our resident group to share the internal report that we produce from management for that to go to the resident group. One of the conversations we started to have was understanding the logistics and practicalities of setting up a resident appeals panel. So after stage two, um, because, because the designated person uh, is, is due to be removed in October, um, where residents can actually ask a complaints panel made up of residents and staff to review the outcome of a stage two before it goes to the housing ombudsman. So we're currently looking at the viability of setting up that type of panel where residents can review how the stage one and stage two have been handled and dealt with and potentially could overturn that decision or, or find in favour of the council. So um, I think part of the challenge is um, finding a group of residents that could be committed to reviewing the, the stage two complaints um, and understanding um, how the terms of reference could work. Thanks, th thanks very much. And, 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 uh, interesting to kind of put that question to you, Gary, but 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 also what, what you're seeing kind of coming forward is is, is this an issue where uh, you know the people you're dealing with you're you're seeing it very much the landlords themselves in the driving seat or to what extent are, are you having is it's kind of the kind of customer insight and customer um, I mean like co-production co-creation of, of services coming through as well is, is that is that a conversation people are having is that obvious to you when you're you're working with with um, individuals and organisations in the sector. Yeah, great. Yeah, great. Great question and good. Good uh, kind of, sort of top up to it as well. Um, yeah, I think you know certainly what we're seeing is the more information that you can share with tenants um, and lessons learned, the better. Um, and, and certainly the response rate and the feedback off off the back of it tends to be really really positive. 
um, a lot of organizations now, and, and I'm certain that a lot of you are no different to this, is you know, having you know, kind of sort of resident or tenant um, uh, in, engagement or te tenant liaisons uh, kind of groups. Um, those are really, really good, you know, sort of um, uh, idea generation or, or sort of bouncing off ideas and, and how do you deal with it. So um, everyone treats them slightly differently um, and, and how they're engaged or, or certainly um, involved in the process. But the most important thing is, is to involve other tenants or tenant liaisons in, in some capacity, um, you know, to, to, to share that, which, which is always, always a positive thing in my mind. The, the the biggest thing is don't hide from the information and, and at least if you've learned a lesson, um, share that lesson that you've learned. Um, I think again, when we go to over communicating, sometimes that's such a positive thing that you can be doing to say, look, here's an issue, we found it, you know, it's coming across really regularly. Um, you know, we, we wanted to share that with you. If you've got the same challenge, get in touch and we'll see if we can help you out and sort you out. So um, as I say, from, from my perspective, I would always share a lesson learned um, in, in every way, shape or form. I would communicate that in so many different ways as, as, as much as possible um, through multiple channels because all of your tenants are going to receive information in a different 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 way um some of them won't always be online uh, won't always be on your website looking at what's you know what's happened or what, what's 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 been involved so um you know sh sharing as, as much information as you possibly can is, is you know can never be a negative thing especially when it comes to what have we learned as an organization uh, thanks gary and, and it, it's interesting to reflect on that when we, we hear the ombudsman and the um, uh, and indeed the government talking about the, the kind of need to rebuild trust and to, to, for people to have faith that I guess that that, that, that process is is, is going to achieve something or deliver deliver something that's so that that kind of communication and communicating via multiple channels re really um, important to, to, to reflect on. Um, there's a question from Sarah to Lorraine, um, uh, again, focused in, the, in, in, in this area, but um, how do you remain consistent if you focus on customer voice over policy um so so an interesting so that as you said uh, i like the idea by the way um but but actually within that idea it raises some questions about consistency of approach consider you know that, that you're treating people fairly and um, so uh, yeah over to you lorraine yeah i think um really it was the case of we've got quite a clear structure within our policy and procedure in terms of handling complaints so that was um very sort of um, clear and set down and um, managers, responding managers are very aware of it. So what I kind of specifically was referring to in the managers um, complaints training was not focusing too much on telling them what they already knew and what they were already familiar with because we had that very much set in stone and it was working well and people were getting things um, responded to within time frame and they were all using the same layout they were all using um, the CRM system so that was all kind of we'd already kind of made quite a lot done a lot of work with managers around that so we had that sort of in place and working well what we wanted to do then was take it to the next level and really the next level was a lot more nuanced and it was more around okay so it's all very well we can tick the boxes and we can do everything sort of in theoretically correctly but are we really really understanding and listening to what the customer is saying have we really identified what the issue is the customer may say that the issue is one thing but is there anything underlying that that is actually um hiding a, a wider problem um and do we know do we need to speak to the customer before we even start investigating to make sure that we fully fully understood what the issues are um, and during a lot of those conversations that we've we've started to do either the, the manager or in the complaint support team is to really get a, a true handle on the um, issues that have been identified in the first instance and um, because what we found often is we can end up going sort of down the track and then find that actually we've we've missed something quite major um, from the outset. And if we'd listened and spent then invested that time in the, in the beginning to really understand what the customer was saying, um, we would have then, that would have informed our investigation and then, you know, hopefully um, resulted in a positive outcome for the customer. So it was about changing people's mindsets and, and not seeing it as, you know, something else that's in the in tray or in the inbox. Everybody's really busy. Um, it was about trying to kind of get people to take that step back and actually think for that customer, something's gone wrong. Um, either, you know, a small thing or a larger thing, it doesn't matter. Something's gone wrong. And we really need to kind of put ourselves in that customer's shoes and think about, you know, that's their home. It's their, their, their life. It's their experience. And we need to make sure that we're really understanding that before we start investigating and responding as a, as a complaint. 
Thanks very much. And just to push at that a little bit, Sean, I'll bring you, you in now. I mean, you were talking about the kind of siloed, siloed approach and tackling that. Um, so how, I guess if that is if that is a problem, how do you go about identifying that in the first place? Because I'm, I'm just thinking nobody's setting out to, to deliver a bad service here. Nobody's setting out to run a bad, like, like, and nobody's setting out for those gaps to exist for people to kind of fall, fall in between. Um, so how, how, how challenging has that been to overcome? And I guess... I suppose in the first place, what questions you need to ask to, to understand that those gaps are there? Because I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, some of the audience perhaps who are saying they're, they're a bit further behind in the journey. Um, what, what, how, how do you kind of like go, yeah, we've got some gaps here. This is where, this is where it's falling down. I think I mean, when you look at how, you know, if you're delivering a service and you've got separate teams delivering, you know, repairs or you've got separate teams within housing management delivering different aspects of housing management and income, it is unfortunately natural, isn't it, for humans to go, I'm just doing, this is the job I'm paid to do and I'm just going to do my bit of the job. And no matter how you wish it were otherwise, I guess, that's for most people, they come to work and they do the job and they've done their bit of the job well. And it was, for us, it was opening their eyes to, well, they have done their bit of their job well and if they were responding to a complaint, they probably responded fairly well to their bit of the complaint. But if you'd looked at the complaint, it might have been, there's another part of the service that that's impacted on. So someone might be struggling with repairs and that's why they've done something somewhere else in their tenancy that's led to us responding in a certain way. So for us, it was kind of getting people to recognise that a tenant or customer isn't just interacting with one service and that their, they see, their tenancy for them isn't just that one little bit of the service, it's all of the services put together, despite how we might see it. So changing that mindset on that. And then looking, working with managers and staff at how do we close those gaps? What would be better for you to enable you to close those gaps or to make it easier for you to understand the gaps that exist between yourselves? So for us, it was a lot of you know managers meeting together to discuss issues. If we got a complex complaint in that cut across a number of different areas, that we'd, we'd make one person responsible for coordinating the response with the other managers and they'd work together to bring that response together. So it's just providing people, I guess, with solutions to overcoming those barriers between the silo barriers that exist, but also the expectation from senior management that that managers would be working towards overcoming those barriers and the expectation, expecting those managers to expect their staff to overcome that and putting that in one-to-ones and having those regular discussions. I'm not saying, Martin, in any way that we've, we've overcome that and, you know, we've got a meeting in the diary for a couple of weeks' time that's actually called GAPS. <laughs> the gaps that exist between services so it's never i don't think it's ever one and done i think it's something you have to work at constantly to improve and and overcome to be fair so yeah absolutely keep keep plugging away and i, I just took a, yeah. a, 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 a comment come question from um joe uh, is the issue not the lessons learned but the so what factor i.e what if you change the results of the learning just in response to one of the earlier points from lorraine i think um i'll wrap things up in a minute but but gary just to, to kind of come to you with one one last question um because I, I i guess just talking about the gaps there so just to turn on that and uh, and we've seen from the, the response to the, the survey earlier today, people in slightly different places. Um, how do you go about um, identifying where those gaps are? And actually, to, to what extent are you seeing people who, who are, are very, when they're coming to you, kind of very aware of what, 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 what gaps they want to fill? Or, or is it still is there still some, some distance to travel before the sector, I suppose, properly understands itself, perhaps? I, I wouldn't go as far as saying it's, it's sector wide. Um, I would say it's individual organization to organization. Um, and I think the gaps to fill is very much reliant on um, a little bit of data and, and data uh, kind of mining, if I'm brutally honest. Um, every organization will have a different challenge, um, you know, from region to region to location to location. Uh, you know, every organization will be slightly different albeit will have relatively similar uh, tracks or channels. Um, and, and certainly that's that's what I've seen in my experience. Um, yeah, so, so that, the, the first part is understanding what, you know, where your gaps are. And I, I think before working with us, a lot of the organizations that we currently work with didn't really know where their gaps were, didn't really know where their challenges were, and didn't really understand why they were getting a behemoth of complaints around a certain area because they hadn't read or hadn't listened to these individual triggers that were driving some of these major complaints. So that's the first part that I would I would always 
you know engage and and and, and talk about there were, were a couple of other questions about actually how do you get more tenants involved or how do you get tenants to respond and tenants to to reply and you know what we're seeing is organizations um, and, and certainly within the housing sector we do work in other sectors as well but within social housing of promoting quarterly incentives you know quarterly prize draw to win a hundred pound gift voucher for amazon whatever it may be and what we're seeing is you know between 30 to 40 percent of tenants responding to service and repairs um you know to give direct level feedback um and that happens within around about 60 to 70 minutes of an, a service repair being uh, being completed by the operative now that's your key point is as soon as that repair and maintenance is being completed, being able to jump on it quickly and effectively and efficiently. So um, that's certainly the big, big focus for, for certainly where I'm seeing is how do we get more feedback from tenants? And then how do I how do I data mine that to understand where my gap is? Um, that would be my first first port call. Once you know where your gaps are, you, you can then, you know, w work your way in, into into solving and, and hopefully um closing down some of those gaps but that would be the the, the, the way to respond for me thanks gary and i think i think a really important point it's just 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 for the for, for people tuning in the questions you should be asking in order to to identify um a, what your problems are and, and uh you know which gaps need to be filled and then how to go about um um doing it because yeah i mean i think that's you know you've you've heard what the government thinks what the ombudsman thinks from its reports and the evidence it's producing um but but actually yeah, the the question is uh, why um and i think um we've we've um uh, gone some way to, towards answering that and the next steps um through through the, the presentations and the, the responses today we've had a huge number of questions come in i've got through as many as as possible and hopefully that's going to cover uh, certainly the themes of the question the questions that are coming in and so thank you all very much for for tuning in um, thank you to our panel um, for a really um, fascinating series of presentations and a really um, interesting and thought-provoking debate. Um, thank you very much to Locales for sponsoring and making today possible. Um, and all that remains for me to say is, um, yeah, thank you very much and see you next time. Thanks.